Well, hey, welcome to Afterthoughts with my lovely Valentine, Bree. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, like I said before, when we when we do these recordings, it's not after the service, but you get to watch them after the service. So we try and, you know, lead you in a direction that we think that uh, that we're going to go. And, and this week, Bree is preaching, so that's why she's here, and I get to lead uh, in the questions. But today is also Valentine's Day, so happy Valentine's Day, Bree. Oh, thank you. Yeah. What about me? Am I not your Valentine? Happy Valentine's Day, Lee. Oh, see? Isn't that oh. nice? That's so lovely. Yeah. So on Sunday, um, you preached in our uh, family or our Celebrate Break service. And why don't you just give us a quick kind of recap or like a rundown of what you talked about, where you headed? Yeah. I began talking a little bit about the difference between children and adults and how we learn and how our brain is able to process things. And there's quite a difference between um, children and adults. And I um, am super comfortable in front of children because they are so um, creative and just want to learn all the things that you have for them. And they're just so excited about all the things. And um, speaking to adults is a little bit harder for me. And so as I was preparing for this sermon, I put some thought into the difference between children and adults and the complexities that occur in the adult mind as we're looking at truths that Jesus is teaching us. So I start a Mm. little bit briefly talking about that. And then I move into um, uh, Jesus talks about... In Matthew 5, 41, he talks about going the extra mile. So I break that down with um, just giving some examples of what a mile is and what the context of the verse is and what Jesus is trying to say. And meanwhile, I'm also tell a childhood story that helps us understand what going the extra mile is looking like for um, real life. And then in the end, we just t- I just talk about how kids process that information and that truth and then how adults can process that. So as I was, you know, reading through and, and thinking about um, what you're going to share, um, one of the first things that right off the very beginning, you had this whole, you know, when, when you add adults into the mix, so there's the kind of that simple truth that you said of like kids are, they just accept almost like kind of the unvarnished simple truth. And and because their lives are so simple, that simplicity just gets applied immediately. Like it, there, there's no complication to that, um, which, you know, when you look at when, when Jesus said, like, like, unless you have the faith of this child, like you, yours is not the kingdom of heaven. Like they're going to inherit the kingdom. And so there's something about understanding kind of the, the simplicity of, um, and the application of that truth. And so children just, again, seem to seamlessly do that so easy. But I liked how you said here, when you put adults in the mix, everything is complicated. So when you tell you that God loves you, there's a million thoughts that bombard our minds. Like, hey, God loves you. Yeah, I know. But do you know? Mm-hmm. Like that like that question of like, do you know? Like, yes, I know that God can't love me. If God knew, you know, my past or he knew what I did, he wouldn't love me. Is God even real? What if... Was that God loving me when that really horrible thing to me happened? Um, You know, God loves everyone, but probably not me. I don't even know if I want God's love. Like all of the complications we bring into adults because of all of the difficulty and some of the kind of the messed up stuff that we've witnessed um, stops us from from seeing the simple truth. So I really like that, like that, just to get again, giving that thought of like when we talk about children's ministry, we talk about adult ministry. Um, it is very different. Like we talk to children differently than we do talk to adults because they're in a different process in their brain, but they, but they don't also have the complexities often that we have. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there can be these simple truths that seem so simple and so basic, and yet they are profoundly applying them in their lives and it's transforming them in ways that, that in some ways as, as adults, we look back and and we wish for those simpler times. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I would be curious uh, within our small groups, just the question that popped up to me um, is when you think back to growing up, you think back to your childhood, what are some of the most profound, simple truths that were so transformational for you um, in faith? And and for some of you, maybe this is a, this is a difficult question because maybe you came to faith as an adult. Um, 
But I think even if you reach back, even if you didn't know Jesus until you maybe you were in your 40s, I think you can probably still reach back to your childhood and think of truths that were um, very foundational. Think of the positive truths that were transformational in how you loved, how you understood, how you saw the world, um, how you cared for others, and some of that simplicity and how it was transformational. So just pause the video and, and uh, ask that question to your group. We continued on in the in the sermon, and, and uh, you talked about like who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and unless you turn again from your sin and change and become like these children, um, so you you start to kind of um, you teach these le- teach the lesson, and you talk about um, your story with Susie. So why don't why don't you just very quickly just give us like the a Cole's notes version as a reminder of that story because mm. we've only heard it like once, mm-hmm. so. I'm going to ask a kind of a question that relates to Susie, but if you right. don't remember the yeah. story, you're, you're going to have no idea. So give us the Coles notes. Okay. Well, um, it, Susie wasn't her name, but this is what I'm calling her. And I actually don't actually remember her name, but Susie is the name that I've chosen for her. And um, my mom had told me that I needed to hang out with Susie. So I was in about grade one. And looking back, I can, I can realize that my mom – saw that maybe this girl needed a friend. And so she required me to walk to school with her, invite her to my birthday party and, and always, always think about Susie. Um, and as you can tell from my story, uh, Susie wasn't always so kind to me. So Mm. the first story I tell is my birthday party where my mom insisted that I invite her. And when I opened the present, Susie took the present and told me that it wasn't actually for me and it was a mistake. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> I don't actually remember my reaction. Um, obviously, I was I was I was devastated because it was a really cool present. But mm-hmm. I also wasn't surprised because this was something that she tended to do. Um, the second story I tell is the cupcake story, and I talk a little bit about um, different kinds of lunches that we all had. So, Lee, when you were younger, what kind of lunch did you have? Did you have the whole grain sandwich, no. everything's homemade, or the processed? I had like a combination of processed and uh, old farmer lunch, like <laughs> old man lunch that my my friends would look at it and go, why do you have that kind of sandwich? Like my friends just used to give me a hard time about jam and cheese sandwiches <laughs> that now as I get older, like that's just a charcuterie board in bread, like jam and like a, like a, fruit and cheese that actually goes together that's very like high cuisine (laughs) I didn't know that at the time and they just made fun of me of jam and cheese being really weird sandwich but turns out I was really high class so that's that's awesome that's great yeah my dad was high class so I definitely had the very healthy lunch I even remember one time my mom (laughs) um made all the sandwiches beforehand and froze them because for efficiency, she thought it was just a great idea. Well, so your parents were both teachers. Yeah, they both worked, yeah. and that w- yeah. it was a lot. And so we, I would have like soggy sandwiches because by the time they melted, yeah. they'd be soggy. It was the worst idea ever. But um, so th- the story is that I, for some reason, there was going to be a cupcake in my lunch every day that week. This is what I remember, and the cupcake get, kept going missing. But there'd be crumbs yeah. there. And I, I remember telling my mom, and I don't know, I don't know why she didn't believe me or what was going on, but no one seemed to believe me forever. But eventually I I actually tracked down those crumbs. And I don't know, <laughs> but they were in Susie's, they were in Susie's locker. Yeah. And um she I, I do remember her saying that she might have taken them, kind of like I did, but I'm not gonna say it. Right. So another situation where Susie was not kind to me. She took took my cupcakes. Yeah. Um, And then the last story is, um, oh, uh, the rule at our school. This is so funny to me when I think about it because, I mean, it must have been a problem because we weren't allowed to go in any um, mud puddles at at the school or on the way to school. And it was talked about a lot. And if you did, which I didn't tell in the sermon, was my dad was the principal. And he was the one that came up with the garbage clothes. So he actually made you clothes out of garbage bags that you had to wear if you came to school wet. And so Susie and I were walking. That was back in the day. I wonder if you get away with that today. Like, would (laughs) he get fired? I don't know. I don't know. I was trying to think of my like little brain, grade one Brie, 
would she have actually thought that might be fun? Right. Like, were there some kids that actually thought that was kind of cool like, and fun? Like, would you come on purpose wet so that you get to wear a garbage bag clothes all day? Yeah. I don't know. Because it wasn't, I didn't feel shamed. But maybe, right. I'm sure the older you got, the more you would be. I'm right? sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, we were walking to school together because I had to walk to school with her and we were playing in a puddle and somehow, and like I said, I don't remember specifics. I just know that she didn't push me in, but something happened that caused me to fall and it was her fault. And the teacher drove by. So I actually didn't share this in the sermon, but I didn't actually have to wear those clothes because my dad was the principal. And so she sent me home right away and told me to go change. Mm -hmm. And so when I got back to school, I was all dry dry, and I didn't have to wear the garbage, garbage, garbage bag clothes. clothes. But yeah. <laughs> so my, my memories of this young girl are not great. And I didn't like being around her and she was not kind to me. You know, reflecting on this story, and, and I'm sure that it's relatable for most people have someone in their life that has treated them unfairly um, or you know you've maybe you've gone out of the way to 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 be their friend and, and you've been wounded by them um, or someone that you thought was supposed to be safe ended up not being safe or you know like it, there, there's multiple ways in which there's parallels I think within the story um, but you know like as as we were kind of trying to think of like, what's a good question? I was thinking one of the questions you came up with was reflecting on the story of Susie and the principle of going the extra mile. How can we apply Jesus's teaching in our everyday lives, especially in situations where we feel inconvenienced or treated unfairly? So I, it is, it is a, a little bit of the, you fight, I think the good, you know, you fight the good, intention of you want justice for people and justice for yourself. And, and, and we tell our kids and we tell even people like, you know, stand up for yourself. Like don't get walked on. Like there's something about that. That's good. Mm -hmm. And that's good kind of self-preservation and good self leadership, I guess, to stand up for yourself. Um, and at the same time, how many times did we see Jesus teach or show this turn the other cheek model where he doesn't stand up for himself, but rather takes it and loves the enemy or the unfair person across from them in a way that is transformational in their lives. And it, it's just kind of opposite of, you know, like we want to stand up and fight for justice. And I wonder sometimes like that's good, but then also there's times where that's actually the wrong thing to do. The right thing to do potentially is turning the other cheek and continuing to love and care. So this whole inconvenience or um, unfair situations we find ourselves in, like how, how should we respond? Like, and that's, that, again, that's where it's simple for kids. Like they have a much simpler life to ask that question. But as adults, this is really complicated question mm -hmm. because you are constantly trying to figure out, is this about justice or is this actually an opportunity in humility and in service to others, into loving my enemy well, am I called to serve them and love them? And to truly turn the other cheek, to pick up, you know, the backpack and walk the extra mile, um, you know, to, to, to hand them over my cloak because they stole my tunic, right? Like, like, mm -hmm. like all of the, the things he talks about. Well, and I think that's where we really have to rely on the Holy Spirit because Mm -hmm. we make it really complex. And, and when we make time to listen and find wisdom from God, the Holy Spirit can lead us in those situations. Um, that helps us get out of our brain maybe if it's not as complicated as we make it be often. Mm -hmm. And to show kindness and, and what we're doing in our, in our lives to those people um, is always a yes. Always, however our reaction will be, it should be done in kindness. Yep. I think, you know, the last thing, and this is kind of where you, you know, you wrapped up, you told the story and that's, and we've already referenced it, I think with your story of Susie. And then from there you went on to talk about, you know, the story of, of walking the extra mile that Jesus tells and, and like the history of that, which I thought, again, find fascinating. 
um, to be reminded of that. I hadn't thought about that in a long time. Mm. So it's always cool to be reminded of real history of like, these are not just phrases that (laughs) that he said for no reason. Like Mm -hmm. they had deep meaning to the original audience. Um, And I love that you teach that to the kids. Like downstairs, like this is this is what you would teach them when you're teaching a Bible story. It's not just, hey, you know, you know, Noah and the ark, and there was there was animals, and let's <laughs> is everyone let's paint a picture of the ark and move on. Like you give historical context, you you know, you teach some of those things. I think that's really amazing. And so this would be, uh, you know, this is a good insight for all of us of like how do we teach the scripture? How do we teach the Bible when we're downstairs in SBC Kids? Um, and I and I remember. You know, as when I first learned this, and you reminded me again, um, that whole going the the extra mile, like that's not just a small thing, like that wasn't a small ask of Jesus. Like he was asking something that, like again, is almost unjust. Mm-hmm. It would have shocked them yes. when they heard him say it. Like that, they would have said, "That's not that's not correct. Mm-hmm. You are incorrect," mm-hmm. and yet. This is what Jesus is calling them to do of like the Roman soldier comes and says, hey, carry my pack, which is a hundred pounds, right? Carry it in a hundred pound pack. I mean, that's heavy and you have to carry it not just a mile. So, you know, we talked about it's, it's 1.6 kilometers. And if a step is about a meter, that's 1600 steps in a mile. Mm -hmm. So now it's instead of 1600, he's asking you to do 3,200 steps in Mm a hundred pound pack. Which sometimes, I th- for some people, 25 steps would be wa- far too much. I like the idea that there's a big difference in the the first mile is that you had to do it. That's right. And it was second, law. Yeah. The second mile is is the, you're choosing, you're choosing to, to do that. There's a yeah. huge difference between those two miles. I wonder, and and this is my, this is where I was getting that with, I'm glad that you brought that up. This is, this was my question that's kind of burning in my head is I wonder how do we relate that in modern ways? Like what, what are the things that we do that are, that are kind for others that are like almost requirements? Like, uh, think of them as like the social requirement of, you know, if if your neighbor comes over and asks for a cup of sugar, like there's kind of a social requirement for you to go, oh, sure. Like here's a cup of sugar, right? What does it look like to go to the extra mile in some of these, like what is required socially to like save face and to say that I'm not a jerk, right? Or when people are mean or when they speak against us or when we, you know, when, when, when people treat us unfairly or unkind, or it could be because of our faith, it could be because of just, they're just hurt people, hurt people. Someone said to me today, right? Like we feed it, we find this in a lot of places, but there's like the socially acceptable answer. And then what does it look like actually to go the extra mile? Right? So I think about there. Jerry and Aggie, uh, who are wonderful people in our church, I heard a story that their neighbor told me um, during a poker game. So, no, don't judge me that I was at a poker game with some coaches, but uh, I was with Jerry and Aggie's neighbor was sitting around the table. He could not stop talking about how amazing they were um, as neighbors because of it's he's like they it's like they go over the top in caring for us as neighbors, like between meals, and even Jerry will come and like. You know, we'll be shoveling driveways and I try and shovel theirs. I try and get there first. Uh-huh. Jerry's out there, and, <laughs> right? Like he, he just, he said, felt very loved by Jerry and Aggie. And, and it was mm-hmm. because of a little bit of the, here's what's kind of socially acceptable to be a good neighbor. Mm-hmm. And it's like Jerry and Aggie just love their neighbor up here. Mm-hmm. Like they go the extra mile. And how in this man who has no faith and now for the first time was sitting with a pastor freely for the first time around again, a weird place to meet your pastor as a poker table, but to then be able to tell the story that now I get to share in a small group video at church to go, this is what going the extra mile looks like, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So I'm curious, you know, in your group as you share, and I don't know if Jared and Aggie are watching this, and if you are, I'm sorry if I embarrassed you, but uh, it's a, it was such an amazing story to me, and you know who the neighbor is. Um Where are those areas in our lives, again, where there's kind of what's expected, but then what does it look like to go that extra mile? Um, And just talk practically, Um, like where are those practical places and where can you challenge each other or challenge yourself to go, you know what, I haven't been going the extra mile and I'm going to look for the opportunity to do that in the next week or two. Um, And be like kids and practically apply it like right now. Like don't make it complicated. Mm -hmm. Make it a simple yes. 
of what does it look like to go the extra mile. So. Bree, thanks for thanks for for doing this. I know that preaching in front of of the adults is not your favorite thing, no, nope. <laughs> by any stretch. Um, but I appreciate it because I think what it does is it gives us a really great window again of of how are we teaching downstairs? What does it look like? What's happening in SBC kids? Uh, because we're removed from it, right? Mm-hmm. It's happening downstairs, and it's, so it's it's good to get the window into that. Good to see, you know, all the things that they're learning. But it's also great to hear your insights and your thoughts because because you're very smart. Mm. So appreciate your time and effort into this. So thanks for doing that. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. This was Afterthoughts with Brian Lee, my (laughs) wonderful Valentine.